The third force, how much impact could it have as we head towards the 2023 general elections? We'll have the spokesman of the National Consultative Front join us this morning to see if the PDP and the APC can be made to take the back seat. And how can Nigeria ensure next month's governorship election in Anambra State takes place without security hitches? A former director of the DSS will be taking us, will be talking to us about that. Governor of Ekiti State wants willing court members to be op opted to help Nigeria safe. Good morning to you and welcome to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's a Thursday morning. We apologize for being just a few minutes uh, behind time, but of course uh, the show must go on and we're here to, of course, uh, keep you company for the next two hours plus. Uh, thanks for joining us. I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. And I am Messi Boko. All right. Um, of course, uh, we start as always with top trending stories. Um, and of course, I share with you some of the big discussions that are going on across Nigeria at the moment. Uh, one of them, of course, I'm starting with the governor of Ikiti State, uh, Kayode Fayemi, who made headlines across social media yesterday with some comments uh, that he made, um, you know, asking that youth core members be recruited uh, in the fight against insurgency. He basically was saying that we need, you know, an extra about 200,000 people to join with uh, our current security, security strength. Um, and so, you know, we need to, you know, get youth core members to join in the fight against insurgency, you know, give them some militancy or militant training. And, you know, for those who do not want to uh, take part, you know, then they should, of course, you know, uh, take part in community service instead and not be paid. So he says, yes, you know, if you're willing, if you're willing, call member, join the army or join, you know, in the fight against insurgency, you get paid. And those who don't want to get uh, paid or who don't want to join would not get paid um, and some of all of that. Um, of course, this created a lot of, you know, conversations across, uh, you know, social media. A lot of people actually, you know, just laughed at, you know, at it and said he must be joking. Definitely. Um, um, well, yeah, well, he, he definitely must be joking. But it's not the first time, and this is what I'll say, it's not the first time that we've heard things like this. If you remember from our legacy state governor, Balame Tinubu, had said this at his uh, colloquium uh, a few months ago, where he said that Nigeria, you know, should recruit 50 million youths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I still says, remember that video very well. I mean, have you ever thought to yourself why, you know, uh, the issue of security is in the exclusive list? And that's because it's a very sensitive issue. Uh, so we, you, you just can't just wake up and say, let's recruit uh, core members to become. It's a very sensitive issue. It's a profession. I mean, it, it requires a lot of training. It requires a lot. And where we are today, if you look at the security situation, we're still talking about the hashtag NSARS. And up until now, all of the reforms that have been called on, uh, I mean, the fact that Nigerians are asking that the police force be reformed, that hasn't really happened. And that's because we just have anybody and anyone in the police force. So, I mean, asking at this point in time where a lot of Nigerians are asking that, hey, we need to take a pause, we need to look at the security sector, we need to ensure that there's a reform. We can just wake up and just say, let's recruit every and every other person. Yeah, you so know, it's a very sensitive, I mean, it's a very said, sensitive sector and it, need, it needs a lot of attention. I've know? always said, you know, that... <sighs> So a lot of times when we hear things like this, and it's not just from, you know, Coyote Fayemi, and this is from Lai Mohammed, from Abubakar Malami, many of the pe persons in government today who speak on behalf of government, Femi Adesha, not even. A lot of t times, you know, I think uh, from our number of governor Peter Obi said this also in an interview earlier this week where he said um, that um, uh, um, Abubakar Malami, uh, the Minister of Justice, you know, should think clearly before he speaks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, I've also, you know, thought to myself, a lot of times these people don't really put thought into some of the things that they say. They really just make a statement and go home and continue living their lives and don't really, really realize um, what exactly that statement means. And it's a, another example of a situation like that where he's making um, such a statement. But, but the thing is, um, yes, I agree with you that we really need to stop making these knee-jerk reactions to solving issues in Nigeria. Mm. We need to understand where we have failed. And like you've mentioned, the police has continued to fail. 
um, some of the things that we're dealing with concerning insecurity today are things that could have been handled by the police. We don't necessarily even need the army in every little. And, and, and it's, in, it's civil, now gotten in, in so civil bad. situation. Yeah, it's gotten so bad that we now have the army. And I'm going to refer to the Chiwetalo story. Those are things that the police can handle. If you think that a person is, you know, causing little, little bits of chaos here and there or whatever it is, the police can handle that. You don't need the army at every single time to bring itself out. And so when we have a failed police system, we have a failed N NSCDC, we have everything basically that has been at its poorest level. That's when you start to hear ideas like this, or maybe we should recruit core members. We've not been able to take care of the police, we've not been able to take care of NSCDC. Now we want core members to join the fight against us. You know, in all of this is the fact that if you look at the security force and uh, you know security architecture across the board, you find that we have lost professionalism. And it would be really wrong for us at this point in time to be calling you know, for recruiting anyone and anyone into the system. That's not the way out. Nobody, nobody is going to. I don't think there's any core member. You know, across the whole country. I don't think there's anyone living and breathing that will willingly join the fight against insurgency. Even if you force call members, I don't think there's anyone. There's even less call members willing to go to the north to serve. Talk less of the ones that you now send to the north and that they're not going to teach now. They're instead going to carry, you know, small cutlasses or small weapons to go join the fight against insurgency. It's not even going to happen. But I'll quickly say that, um, yes, you know, we might not like you know, that idea here. But I know that um, in China, you know, and I read somewhere, let me quickly share this. It says um, 75 countries around the world have some form of uh, compulsory military training or national service for their citizens. Mandatory military service in South Korea and Singapore lasts for at least two years, while the majority of these countries only conscript, conscript men. There are, you know, about six other countries, Israel, North Korea, Eritrea, Tunisia, and Morocco, and Mali, and some others um, that conscript men and women. So it's not, you know, an alien idea or an alien concept. You know, there's other countries that do these things. And some, in some of these countries, it is compulsory that you have some military training. Um, but those countries aren't necessarily doing it to fight insurgents. You know what? It's like, you know, trying to, trying to you know, uh, move away from a particular step. I mean, you can't just be born as a baby and then the next thing you, you expect that you start working and start talking. Now, there's a process. Let's, let's even talk about the entire police force. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's, I mean, I think we need to overhaul the entire system, a total reform. So we can't be asking that, yes, let's start training some part. Let's get it right first from the basics. And if we can get it right from the basics, then we can start thinking about incorporating, you know, that into our institutions and ensuring that you have young lads having, yep. you know, all of that training. Well, mm. not, not going to happen in the next... Anyways, next moving next. away from that now, let's also talk about, we're going to talk about this particular one. I call it very, it's a very sad incident. It's a situation where you have a 100-level student who committed, who killed himself, committed suicide, however, and that happened where he burnt himself. It's really, really sad. We're definitely going to bring you that video in no time, and then we'll talk about it. Well, there you have it. And this happened in uh, University in Anambra State, um, I believe, uh, where an undergraduate student committed suicide. Uh, he apparently had asked a friend of his for 200 naira to buy something and apparently bought uh, some petrol, uh, took it to the room and set himself on fire. And, you know, according to the report, it's been reported that uh, he was stressed. That's what he said. He said he was stressed and then he killed himself. Now, this is what I will say. The support system, the family is a major support system. And it's high time the family begins to pay attention. Now, when we talk about family, we're talking about, you know, the nuclear family. We're talking about the extended family. I really don't know because gradually we're beginning to lose, you know, humanity. So it's time that, you know, the support system, first of all, we call on the family. We call on every other support system, the church, you know, the mocks and every other support system around. But majorly, it's the family. And then I think that, you know, the culture of uh, we not being very honest to ourselves. Because we need to begin to understand. Maybe we need to begin to let people know that failing, it's okay. It's okay to fail. Because we have a situation where you have your parent, you have your father or mother tell you, in my days, I ate all my cusses, I had all Bs, I had all Cs. And so that also could also necessarily be a pressure. So you're in school, and then because dad and mom said they ate all their cusses, you can't afford to have you know, Fs and Ds and what have you. And so because of all of that. But however, it could be, you know, it could be beyond that. It could be academic pressure. It could be whatever pressure. But I'm thinking that, you know, the support system needs to be functional, up and running, so that you can actually, it goes beyond making resources available sometimes. It goes beyond providing, but we need to be well, there emotionally for our kids and every 
you're the yeah, I get that. Office. You know, and I, and I, I agree. You know that um, you know the pressure on students needs needs to be reduced. Um, but we find ourselves in a society where um, you know parents themselves are dealing with their own levels of stress. <laughs> but, you know, and so I mean, you know, really? you know, they're sending you to school sometimes. You know, with every single penny that they have to ensure that they pay school fees, that to ensure that you at least you know get the education that you do, you seek. And so they don't want to hear any excuses as to why you didn't you know perform well enough. And to be honest, this may not even be educational stress. It might be stress from mm. many many other factors. That's exactly sectors. what I'm saying. And you know that's something that we also need to have conversations about um, as young Nigerians. What kind of pressure is a hundred level student being under? It, it definitely cannot be because he's failing. You're in a Hundred level. Maybe where, he, what are you? Maybe, what exactly maybe, did, where did you, you fail? Know, that's the truth now. The, the unfortunate incident, but like I rightly mentioned, is the fact that I mean he's no longer here, and that's really really sad. Because when you don't have the person uh, who actually suffered this uh, to be alive to tell the story, it becomes difficult. So it leaves room for a lot of speculation. What could it be? Could it be academic pressure? Could it be? Uh, whatever pressure, what would he be needing? That's why I'm saying that, hey, it's important. As much as we know that, yes, we live in a society where it's quite difficult to provide, to provide all of those resources and all of that cater for our kids, but it's also important that we pay attention. And sometimes it doesn't really require you know, money. Um, I would really like to understand what a 100-level student, what kind of stress a 100-level student is going through. You never with, can you tell. Know, and, and, and I hope it's not you know, stress financially because you know, you know, a lot of his mates are buying cars, um, you know, and being able to, you know, sp spend money that he doesn't have. And I'm hoping that's not what it is. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I hope it's also not, you know, courtism related. You're, you're in a hundred level. You're in the first year of university. What kind of stress can you possibly be dealing with at that level then? I mean, if you can't deal with a hundred level stress, what are you going to deal with when you're in your third year and you're in your fourth so year? I, so I remember, I remember the time where... Uh, and it's not the first time. We've had people taking, you know, um, that... So, so I, I'm thinking that, you know, it's high time. If this is already happening in our universities, what are universities doing? Are we also having some form of, uh, you know, counseling or what have you? you know answer, to I'm sure you know the answer that to that. Happen? I'm sure you know the answer to that. All right, a final uh, uh, trend story this morning. We'll just quickly rush through it. Is um, Yoruba Nation agitator, Sunday Boho, uh, news re reports yesterday from his lawyer. One of his lawyers, Yomiya Liu, stated that he has fallen sick in prison in uh, Benin Republic. Um, apparently, he was rushed to the hospital, according to the lawyer, and, of course, is diagnosed with either a kidney or lung failure. Um, and that was uh, the report yesterday. If you, of course, remember that he has been uh, held in captivity in the Benin Republic for, you know, more than, you know, this is about two months now uh, since all this started. And, um, you know, it seems like his health might be failing. And there's also reports that, you know, he might have injured himself, you know, while he was, while his, his house was attacked or some, you know, some of all these um, extra, you know, stories here and there. But, of course, these are all conspiracy theories that I'm sure that... He's, he's also demanding uh, that uh, he would like to seek medical attention in yeah, Germany abroad. Or, or France. Yeah. I mean, he's very precise with all of that. But would you blame him? Because it feels like that's the pattern for us. Uh, you see our leaders seeking medical attention outside. Maybe we do not have what it takes uh, here in Nigeria to cater for his health. Or does are saying this could just be another trick, you know, to get away? Yeah, there's, there's that, you know, but I'm also concerned about, you know, how, what this really means. You know, if his health is failing and for any reason whatsoever, um, he dies in a prison in Bene. And of course, I hope that that never happens. You know, what does that really mean and where do we go from there? Um, you know, with the Yoruba nation ag um, agitating um, and, you know, with the whole political, you know, aspects of some of all of this. And is this, you know, a, a strong enough reason for him to maybe be set free and allowed to go back home to Nigeria to answer for some of the questions uh, that the Nigerian government is asking? Or maybe be allowed to go to Germany? I don't think the Benin Republic government will allow anybody to just fly to Germany for medical treatment. or medical. I don't think that, that's, what, that's how it happens. Um, but of course, we wish him well, and we hope that, of course, he remains strong, and um, you know, does come back to Nigeria as quickly as possible, or you know, you know, um, as uh, fate will have it, whatever it is that the Benin Republic government feels he, he deserves, you know, they, he gets it. All right, those are our top trending stories this morning. Stay with us when we come back. Ezekiel Nyai Talk will be joining us as always for Off the Press, where we have a review of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this morning. Good morning once again.